I worked with my dad at Juvenile Hall. That was one of the first first real jobs I had once I turned 21. I remember my first day at work, I had to put handcuffs on like a 12 year old. You know what I'm saying? And, it, and it's, it's rich. You know, as a black kid, his wrist, could, his wrist could slip through the cuffs. You know, that's how small he was. And just, and just doing that, some, some about it made me, made me feel cold. You know what I'm saying? And kind of, kind of like, you know, um, and I worked in San Francisco where, you know, you know, Frisco like, was it like four percent black now? Like city four percent black, something like that right now. You walk through that, through that juvenile hall, and all you see is black kids. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and in that city, you know, it's, it's everybody committing crimes, but it's only one group of children that's getting locked up. You know, and stand in there. Almost all the men and women who made up the movement that you have so long honored, the civil rights movement, were in truth and in fact teenagers. When I met Dr. King, he was 24, I was 26. We were the elders. Men like Stokely Carmichael, 19. Rap Brown, 20. John Lewis, who now serves in our Congress, 18. Jesse Jackson, 19. Diane Nash, 17 years old. 17 years old and with child. And I could stand here on and on, naming a long list of great warriors. And for me, it's for the youth. Man, I don't have kids of my own yet, but man, you think about these babies, man, like my nephews, man, you think about these babies growing up and going through what we going through, man. You know, it's, it, it, it'll, it'll keep you up at night, you know, so, so we got to do something. You know, um, and we, talk, we talked about uh, using our collective power to, to start something, to do something, to raise awareness, to find solutions. Um, and here we are today for our first uh, MLK Now event um, right here at Riverside Church. And one of the speeches of MLK's that was done today was, was he gave in this very church. On April 4th, 1967, Martin Luther King Jr. stood here, right here, and preached a sermon that challenged this country's lust for war. Today, friends, we are so honored to have some of the most compelling and talented voices in America today here to do the same thing to tell hard truths that call us to become the beloved community that Dr. King spoke about so often. So today you'll hear voices from nine different authors, 10 speeches, two from that young man behind me right there, several different men and women who've been a part of the struggle. I think it was eight years ago today that the Supreme Court handed down the desegregation decision. And despite the fact that eight years have gone past, that decision hasn't been implemented yet. Thousands of assassins banded together under the name of Ku Klux Klans, Midnight Raiders, Knights of the Golden Circle, etc., etc., spread a reign of terror by beating, shooting, and killing colored folks in a few years. It is with such activity that the words of the late John F. Kennedy come back to haunt us. Five years ago, he said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Having people read these speeches that were from 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and realizing that so much of what is said, the calls to action remain today. You know, I was shot five times by a police officer. A case of police misconduct, police brutality. I could have easily became a hashtag, you know, but there's a reason why I'm alive. When you think about Trayvon or Mike Brown, they're not able to physically speak for themselves you know I'm, I'm speaking for them and they're living through me and I, I I don't take that for granted we have leaders uh, we have to further acknowledge those leaders and we have to realize that we're all leaders you know what I'm saying um, I refuse to just take a check for Empire and then sit down and shut up it's just it would make no sense to me um, so yeah I'm just you know I'm, I'm humbled to be here and, and, and the honor was all mine it's like why wouldn't I be here What's incredibly ironic about this is, out of the five men that we picked, four of them were murdered by gun violence. Martin Luther King, murdered. Michael Max, murdered. Patrice Lumumba, murdered. And somebody who's very interesting and very dynamic, who one of the most special artists that I know, Michael B. Jordan, will be giving you his words, was a young man named Fred Hampton, who was murdered in his sleep in Chicago. Favorite civil rights historical figure would have to be Fred Hampton, 
uh, for a number of reasons. The fact that he was taken very young from us, the fact that he had so much responsibility and so much you know, influence. My brother at arms, uh, had, had, was fortunate enough to have him every time I've made a movie. Uh, <laughs> Mike B. Jordan. Power anywhere where there's people. Power anywhere where there's people. A lot of people get the word revolution mixed up and they think revolution is a bad word. Revolution is nothing but like having a sore on your body and then you put something on that sore to cure that infection. And I'm telling you that we're living in an infectious society right now. I'm telling you that we're living in a sick society right now. I'm telling you that we're living in a sick society and anybody that endorses integrating into a sick society before it's cleaned up is a man who's committing a crime against the people. We, the Black Panther Party, because of our dedication and understanding, went into the valley knowing that the people are here in the valley. Knowing that our plight is the same plight as the people in the valley. Knowing that our enemies are on the mountain and our friends are in the valley. And even though it's nice to be on the mountaintop, we're going to go back to the valley. Because we understand that there's work to be done in the valley. And when we get through with this work in the valley, we're going to go to that mountaintop. We're going to go to that mountaintop because there's a buffalo on that mountaintop that's playing king. And he's been bullshitting us. And we've got to go on that mountaintop, not for the purpose of living like he lives, living his lifestyle, that's not it. We got to go up on that mountain table to make that go for them understand that God made it. we are coming from the valley. Yo, rest in peace, Fred Hammond. He died at 21 years old in his sleep next to his woman. We got a super, super special surprise for you guys. Um, another mu music performance um, by an extremely talented young man named Jesse Smollett. If I were to say Martin Luther King Jr., the first thing that comes to your mind, solidarity. Solidarity and fighting for freedom through organizing. You know what I'm saying? Because we have started to believe that somehow peace mean, could, can mean to just stay silent, but that's not peace. Peace is standing up and yelling and screaming and saying what is right and what is wrong and not stopping until that's realized. So, um, yeah, I'd say solidarity and love. I am so beyond honored to be here. Southern trees bear a strange fruit. Black body swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. What do you personally, Jesse, like learn from MLK? His character, his speeches, his story, his life, his death. Love, man. Love. It's the only thing that, that, that matters. It's the only thing that's going to save us. Love, um, not just, I, I was listening to one of his, his speeches and, and he was saying that love, I don't mean, he doesn't mean love just in the emotional, sentimental sense, but love at its very core, at its root, is taking care of one another. You know what I'm saying? It's standing up for, I'm not, I'm not a woman, but I'm going to stand up for women's rights. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not an immigrant, but I'm going to stand up for immigrants' rights. There are, there are, there are people that need us. And for that, Dr. King is the perfect. He exemplified that perfectly. Our next speech um, is by uh, a woman who's very famous where I'm from in the Bay Area, uh, very well known. When I think about black women, you know, my mom, my grandma, my fiance now, and, and this woman who wrote these words coming to mind. Um, it's being delivered to you guys by an incredible actress who I had the ability to just work with uh, very recently. She's become a very close friend like a member of my family, Tessa Thompson.
It's a really wonderful feeling to be back among the people. Our situation bears a very excruciating similarity to the situation of a prisoner. The government views young black and brown people as actually or potentially the most rebellious elements of this society, and thus the jails and prisons of this society are overflowing with young people of color. Anyone who has seen the streets of ghettos and barrios can already understand how easily a sister or a brother can fall victim to the police there who are always there in mass. And tens and thousands of prisoners in city and county jails have never been convicted of a crime. They're simply there, victims. They're there under the control of insensitive, incompetent, and often blatantly racist public defenders who insist that they plead guilty even when they know that their client is as innocent as they are. Part of it is understanding that we need to organize as a community. I think we live in a space now where we're inclined to get on our phones and if we want to talk about injustice, we'll attach it to a hashtag like Black Lives Matter. And that's a fantastic way to organize ourselves. But I think it's also really necessary to get in a room together and speak. It's just real important for young people to see that artists, entertainers really care about these issues. And so when you have powerful artists who are already shaping the culture, come and do something that you don't typically see them do, it was, re it was really powerful. But I'm going to introduce somebody who's very special, who, who, who puts something out that I'm still trying to wrap my mind around. Um, an incredible writer, musician, actor, Mr. Lynn Miranda. In 1957, a sensitive American official overseas said that it seemed to him that our nation was on the wrong side of a world revolution. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. America, the richest and most powerful nation in the world, can well lead the way in the revolution of values. There is nothing except a tragic death wish to prevent us from reordering our priorities so that the pursuit of peace will take precedence over the pursuit of war. There is nothing to keep us from molding a recalcitrant status quo with bruised hands until we have fashioned it into a brotherhood. These are revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression. And out of the wounds of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people in darkness have seen a great light. We in the West must support these revolutions. When I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is God and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. We can no longer afford to worship the God of hate or bow before the altar of retaliation. The oceans of history are made turbulent by the ever-rising tides of hate. History is cluttered with the wreckage of nations and individuals that pursued this self-defeating path of hate. We still have a choice today. Nonviolent coexistence or violent co annihilation. We must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to speak for peace in Vietnam and justice throughout the developing world, a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now, let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. If we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Dr. Martin Luther King at this church, April 4th, 1967.
can numb my soul. As some people say, why do you like being in America if you feel so strongly about what it has done to the African? I really committed to America because of Sojourner Truth. Harriet <laughs> Tubman, Frederick Douglass, and my, my mentor, Paul Robeson, and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. I'm committed to America because what they sacrificed and the struggle they waged cannot be dishonored because I was too lazy to take up the task. Thank you so much, Mr. Belafonte. So this next musical performance is like uh, somewhat of a world premiere. The song's never been heard before performed this way. It's a beautiful song by an artist that's, that's still young and still with us. Um, but when I got a chance to get in touch with him and we asked him to perform this song, he told me that he couldn't because it's too tough for him. You know, we reached out to another beautiful artist in our network and we said, could, she, could you do it? And she worked with some more and they said yes. So um, here's Anika Noni Rose singing, sing, singing Be Free, written by the artist J. Cole. J. Cole. I never interviewed somebody before, bro. <laughs> it's cool, man. We just gonna talk. It'll be right. easy. We spoke, you said that you had never seen somebody perform your music live in front of you. So what what, what, what that feel like just now? Nah, I, I got chills. First of all, we gotta give her a round of applause. She killed that. That was crazy. It's almost like I didn't write that song. You know, and then to realize that I did, it was like, oh man, it was bigger than me. Like that's, you know, that was for a bigger purpose because it, it says so much. And it's like, it was almost grateful. Like, oh God, let me be a part of that. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, so. I'm letting you know that it ain't no gun they make that can kill my soul. And to let y'all know he was right. I can't, um, not that I can't, but in order for me to perform that song, I have to return to a place I mentally and like emotionally, I wouldn't be able to get up and, uh, and just perform it. I would have to dive into a place that like is really hard to get to. And she did way better than I could do anyway, so it's cool. Tell me about what it felt like to write that song. Just going back to that, because I, I made a film that was based off of, off of seeing, seeing video footage of, of somebody like who looked like me being murdered from where I was from. And, and, and I, when you told me that you, didn't, you, can, you can't perform that song, I understand, because I can't, I can't watch that movie. I can't even hear it. It's crazy. Even you saying that, the parallel between, I didn't, I mean, obviously, I, when the Oscar Grant thing happened, I saw the video, too. This is before I was on with music, and I, I'll never forget that image. So when I saw you, when I heard about your film and I seen it, I just want to let you know, bro, and every time I see it, I break down crying like I can't. I can't control it. Like I'm, it's leaking. So you, you really did. You really did that man justice in his story, justice with a real classic that's going, to, you know, stand the test of time. So I got to commend you for that. But it's funny because that same level of like crying and like breaking down that I that I experienced just from watching your film is exactly what uh, inspired the song in a sense, the Mike Brown situation happens and I just happened to catch it live, whether it be on social media or through the news, talking about how this boy didn't do nothing, like they shot him while he was running away, then he was facing him, no gun, and they killed him. So I'm watching this, yo, I put myself in his shoes. He's me. You lived through it. Yes, I allow myself to like 
put myself in his shoes and be in that moment where we all know, as young black men, we know that moment where you're dealing with a police officer, just like Oscar Grant, where you're dealing with a, a police officer who's on a power trip, and it's like, you can see from the mannerisms, it's like, oh, yo, this can go bad real quick. And you know that feeling. So I allow myself to, uh, instead of like blocking it, I allow myself to feel that with the Mike Brown situation. And I got so scared and I got so mad. From artist to artist, you know what I'm saying? We work in different mediums, you know what I mean? But, you know, I just gotta say thank you, bro. Like, like when you put your work out and you express what you're going through, it make me feel less like an alien, you know, you know what I'm saying? Crazy. <laughs> That's crazy, bro. And I feel the same about you. Like, I'm looking at what you're doing. I mean, bro, from the moment I saw that movie, like, and then now to see what you're doing as you elevate and, and even take on bigger tasks. Like, bro, you stand so true. Like, you got to think about it. First of all, you put together this. This is crazy. Bro. Nah, it's just a, gr it's a group of us, bro. It's a group. <laughs> it's a lot of okay. us. Okay. <laughs> it's a group, and much love to the group. But, but you ask me. I'm just letting it be known. Like, bro, you ascending to a new level and, uh, and keeping it authentic. Hey, Keep it a hundred. How many youngsters was here to see J. Cole? Hey, hey, Mr. Hey, hold on. Mr. Mr. Bella, Mr. Belafonte said it, man. It, the movement was done by what? Teenagers, right? How many teenagers came because Cole was on the docket? So it ain't no me, bro. Like, it's, it's us. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's us. I appreciate it. I feel like this is healthy. Like, <laughs> bro, this is two, this is, this is two young black men having intelligent dialogue about what's actually happening right now in America. Like, I'm going to say thank you for including me with this, Come on, bro. bro. Thank you for and like, I, this oh, is man. an honor to Stop be here, bro. Me, bro. Nah, for real. Thank <laughs> you, bro. For real. It's good, man. We, we, are, we, are, we are part of the same body. Real my hand don't wake up and thank the other hand. You just Ooh. move. You know what I'm saying? So, so let's keep moving. You feel me? <laughs> bro.